Hello and welcome to the first of two debates of the Independent Nonpartisan Indiana Debate Commission. We're coming to you live from WFYI in Indianapolis. We'll be hearing from the three candidates on the ballot who want to be your governor. They are incumbent Republican Eric Holcomb, Democratic challenger Woody Myers, and Libertarian challenger Donald Rainwater. Candidates, thank you for joining us and giving voters an opportunity to hear from you. My name is Andrew Downs. I'm the director of the Mike Downs Center for Indiana Politics at Purdue University, Fort Wayne, and a member of the debate commission. I will be moderating the debate. Like so many things these days, we've had to make a few modifications to this debate because of the coronavirus. The candidates and I are in the building at WFYI, but we are in separate spaces. So in other words, we're holding a virtual debate. People from around the state submitted hundreds of questions covering more than 90 topics to the Indiana Debate Commission. The questions for tonight reflect some of the topics covered most frequently. None of the questions or the topics have been shared in advance with any candidate. Candidates will be given one minute to make an opening statement. After that, questions will be asked of all three candidates. Each candidate will have one minute to respond. Candidates may request an opportunity for a 30-second rebuttal. The order for answering questions will rotate. If a candidate exceeds the time limit, the rules state that I shall interrupt and remind everyone of the agreed upon time limits. The order in which the candidates will answer the questions was determined by a drawing conducted by the debate commission. And now for the opening statements. We'll be hearing from Woody Myers first. You have one minute. Good evening, fellow Hoosiers. I'm Dr. Woody Myers. I'm a physician and your former Indiana State Health Commissioner. Together with Representative Linda Lawson, I'm prepared to lead our state in a new direction. I'm prepared to do all that we can do to get us through this global pandemic. You know, we are in the midst of a recession as well. In this recession, we have not had the leadership required from our current governor. He hasn't taken the action steps that are needed. I know that if we move forward together, we can create a new relationship between government and the people. If you elect me your new governor, I know that we can do a much better job for the citizens of this state. I will reappoint Secretary of as Secretary of Education, Superintendent Jennifer McCormick. She has been and will continue to be an outstanding leader Thank for you, our Dr. state. Myers. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Next, we will hear from Governor Eric Holcomb. You have one minute. Good evening, Hoosiers, and thank you, Andrew, and thank you to the Indiana Debate Commission for making all the adjustments necessary to make sure the show would go on and we could have this after-dinner conversation. I also want to thank every Hoosier that is watching tonight, and even the Hoosiers that aren't watching, because it is they who helped us create such positive forward momentum over the last four years. We created momentum and job creation and all-time high wages through the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, capital investment. We made sure infant mortality rates were finally going down and adoptions were going up. We made historic investments in our K through 12 education space and in our infrastructure space. But Suzanne Crouch and I feel like we're just getting started after four strong years of forward momentum. And I'm excited and anxious to talk about that vision going forward. Thank you, Governor. Finally, we will hear from Mr. Rainwater. You have one minute. Good evening. In this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Forty years ago, President Reagan spoke those words. And today, in Indiana, Hoosiers realize that they are just as relevant today as they were when he spoke them. We have crises in Indiana. We have a health crisis. We have an education crisis. We have an economic crisis. But most of all, we have a crisis of government. We have a government that wants to tell us what to do, not give us the information we need to make the choices in our lives. We live in a constitutional republic where we should tell government what we want, not the other way around. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Rainwater. 
It couldn't, shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone that education was one of the most popular topics, and it also probably won't surprise anyone that many of the questions dealt with teacher pay. The first question, a teacher from Jeffersonville asked, I'm a proud resident of Jeffersonville and a teacher of 10 years. I look forward to the day I, can get, I get to send my twin boys, now two years old, to the public schools in my city. However, I continue to work and teach in Kentucky because of the superior pay, benefits, and retirement, and I'm not alone. What can each candidate do to encourage teachers like myself and so many others to come to work in our communities and better support those who already teach here? We'll be hearing first from Dr. Myers. You have one minute. First of all, we can listen to the teachers who've told us now for many years that their pay is substandard. We've known for over 15 years that Indiana teacher pay has been well below that of other states, and we haven't done anything close to what's required in order to uh, get us back to where we were. Uh, Indiana uh, can raise teacher salaries by prioritizing the education in the next budget, and I will do so as your next governor. Uh, it is clear to me that unless we do that, we're going to continue to lose teachers to Kentucky, to Illinois, to Ohio, and from the profession altogether. We can stop wasting money as well on uh, in entities like Indiana Virtual Schools where approximately $70 million was wasted because no one was paying attention to the expenditures. And now there's a criminal investigation underway. We can do so, so much better for our teachers in our state. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Uh, next, we'll be hearing from Governor Holcomb. You have one minute. I appreciate the question, and we are hard at work at this. Indiana rightly prioritizes our public school education. We allocate over 50% of our total revenue, our budget, state budget, to education. Now, that doesn't mean that we're there yet. The good news is, since Suzanne and I were sworn in, we've already increased K through 12 funding $1.6 billion. We paid off local liabilities to the tune of $150 million so that money could get to teacher paychecks. We worked with school superintendents and principals and they said they heard us and they would get it to teacher paychecks. They were true to their word and they did. We also created a teacher pay compensation commission that looks at how are we going to sustainably increase teacher pay so that we get up to a competitive level, meaning up to $60,000 for the average teacher and $40,000 for the average teacher who's just beginning. Thank you, Governor. And finally, Mr. Rainwater, you have one minute. Thank you. So first of all, we need to realize that one of the problems that we have here in Indiana is that we have over-politicized education. And we are spending way too much time talking about how big government can provide education and pay teachers. What we really need to do is get our education system decentralized and get control back to the parents, the teachers in the classroom, the local school boards and school districts who are able then to take the money that is allocated for education instead of it being spent on big bureaucracy here at the state house. That will be the first step to getting teacher pay up where it should be and getting education back into the classroom where it belongs instead of a political tool used by big government. Thank you, Mr. Rainwater. Dr. Myers has requested a rebuttal. Remember, rebuttals are 30 seconds. You know, we've uh, starved teachers for over 15 years in Indiana, and now in the last session, we gave them a 2.7% raise while the charters and vouchers programs got 25%. It's like giving a sandwich to a starving person after 15 years, it tastes good, but it certainly doesn't do the job. It doesn't get us back anywhere close to where we need to be. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Our second question, several questions, of course, dealt with funding for schools in general. Currently, funding for K-12 education is spread across traditional public schools, charter schools, online options, and vouchers. What do you think is an appropriate distribution of funds for K-12 education in Indiana? This time we'll be hearing from Governor Holcomb first. You have one minute. Yeah, as I mentioned at the outset, our number one priority in the state of Indiana is to make sure that we're adequately and appropriately funding our public school system. 
We are doing that. We need to do more in terms of teacher pay. We also, every budget session, deal with the foundational dollars, where we start, the complexity index, the honor diplomas, the CTE funding, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what will occur in January as we go forward. Now, we made historic progress, but I'm so excited about continuing to make sure that parents have the option to best determine where their student goes. By the way, charter schools, mostly in the state of Indiana, are public charter schools. That's of special note, meaning that parents get to decide they, after all, are paying the taxes, and we need to make sure that those revenue sources are intact so that we can appropriately fund our school systems. Thank you, Governor. Next up, Mr. Rainwater, you have one minute. Thank you. So, first of all, let me say that what we need to do in Indiana is make sure that when money is allocated for the education of a child, that money follows that child. It doesn't matter what educational opportunity, whether it's public school, private school, charter schools, online schools, or, or any innovations in education in the future. We need to understand and remember that here again, this isn't about uh, who's funding what where, it's about getting a child educated with the best possible opportunity for them as an individual. Because every child is unique, they need unique educational opportunities, and we need to make sure that it is funded for them as long as the state constitution says we're providing common schools. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rainwater. And last but not least, Dr. Myers, you have one minute. You know, back in, I think it was 2005, 2006, um, we had a funding formula in the state of Indiana that worked, but we changed it. And we changed it to punish the urban schools, the, the schools that were in the big cities, and we've allowed that deficit funding to just increase uh, those differences over the last 15 years to uh, a terrible extent. Uh, now that, that we have the, 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 the superintendents of education throughout our state creating referendums in order to get the communities to fund uh, the dollars that are required. The state should be providing those dollars. We're just not putting enough into the system. Uh, we clearly have not increased teacher funding. We have not increased educational funding to the degree that's required in our state for a 2020 uh, education program. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Eric Holcomb, Governor Holcomb, has requested a rebuttal. 30 seconds, sir. Yeah, I think it's important to note that some years back, we did, in fact, cap our property taxes, which did adjust the allocation of dollars. We did that to provide certainty because people were being priced out of their homes. Now, we have continued to increase K-12 through funding, and we have worked recently, again, $1.6 billion since 2017, and even protected 100% of funding in a year like this year during COVID-19. We'll continue to honor our commitment to our public school system as we go forward. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Rainwater, you also wanted a rebuttal, 30 seconds. Thank you. So first of all, I want to make sure that I make this point to everybody watching and listening this evening. There is no such thing as state money. There is no such thing as public money. That is tax dollars that Hoosiers have been paying that are supposed to go to the education of a child, not this school system or that school system or this type of school, but educating a child. And we need to get back to that. Thank you, Mr. Rainwater. We're going to turn to the pandemic next. Voters from across this political spectrum actually submitted questions about this. The first one comes from a voter in Lebanon. Which, of the, which is of greater importance, mass public safety or individual rights and freedoms? We're going to start with Mr. Rainwater on this one. You have one minute. Well, that's an excellent question. And the reality is, is that only you can determine what risk you're willing to take and what are the appropriate measures that you need to take for yourself, your family, your business, your church, or any other uh, situation that you might find yourself in. You see, the reality is that there is no one-size-fits-all solution to anything, and there is no, um, if you do this, you will be protected, because this is a virus. 
And you can only do what is easiest and best for you to protect yourself. So the reality is, is the one thing that we do know is that the Constitution is there to protect our individual liberties and make those choices for ourselves. Thank you. Dr. Myers, you're next. You have one minute. It's government's job to lead. And if I'm your governor, public safety will always be first. Uh, and yes, we do need a real mask mandate in Indiana, a mask mandate with consequences for the small percentage of Hoosiers who choose not to protect themselves or protect others. It's very similar to what we did years ago when we told people that you couldn't light up a cigarette anywhere you wanted to light it up. You had to go into an area where it wasn't going to hurt other people. It was also similar to the decisions that we made to putting your kids in a car seat. Uh, it's very important to protect their safety and just to protect the safety of others. So a mask mandate is exactly the same. And in a Myers-Lawson administration, a mask mandate will be issued on day one and it will count. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Last for this question, Governor Holcomb. Well, if we all lived alone, you could answer that question independently, but thankfully we don't live alone. We live with one another, and together that's how we'll get through this. Our individual liberty needs to be guarded. When that liberty or those actions start to infringe on someone else, that's where we have to take a look at the public safety. It's just like a seat belt. It's just like wearing shoes in a restaurant. It's just like uh, fire codes. They're meant for safety procedures. We're, we're in an emergency, a public health emergency, so that we do have a state mandated mask uh, requirement throughout the state. It's a strong statement that says this works. And believe you me, we are seeing cases rise. We are seeing deaths rise. And we know how it's spread, wearing a mask, Physically distancing and out of large crowds, good hygiene will help us slow that spread. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Mr. Rainwater, you've requested a rebuttal. 30 seconds. Thank you. So this is the difference between big government and limited government. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say that your individual rights are suspended during a crisis or a pandemic. It also needs to be pointed out that unfortunately, while we are told that they've looked at the science, they haven't shown us the science that definitively proves that a mask mandate makes anything any safer. Thank you, Mr. Rainwater. Uh, Dr. Myers, you requested a rebuttal, 30 seconds. You know, if what we were doing was working, then we wouldn't have record numbers. Almost every day in the last couple of weeks, we've had more new cases of coronavirus than the day or a few days before. Our positivity rate is going up and our hospitals are filling up. We do not have a mass mandate in Indiana. We have a mass suggestion. A mandate has consequences. There are mandates in other states that surround us. We need one here in Indiana. And as your governor, I will put one in place. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Governor Holcomb, you asked for a rebuttal? Yes, in, the, in their infinite wisdom, our state representatives and state senators years back saw fit to address this very scenario, a public health emergency scenario, and made sure that the governor could, in fact, pass a mass mandate. I'm also very appreciative of our federal partnership with the administration, who have, through the CDC and others, provided us guidance how to get through this. And we'll continue to make sure that we correctly balance lives and livelihoods. Thank you, Governor. We're going to move on to our fourth question now. Uh, this one will be about taxes, of course, a topic that comes up rather frequently. One libertarian uh, voter wrote, taxes are a necessary tool to fund a civil republic. Regardless of how necessary we think they are, they often get discussed in terms of winners and losers. So a person from Kokomo asked, can you specifically outline your plan for tax revenue, that would be sales tax, corporate and individual income taxes, as well as other sources, but be sure to include who you think benefits the most and who does not under your plan. For this question, we'll be going to Dr. Myers first. You have one minute. You know, the corporations in Indiana recently have been benefiting the most because their tax rates have been going down whereas individual income taxes have remained the same. You know, we've got to have tax revenues in Indiana in order to do the things that re are required of government. And as your governor, we'll take a very careful look at all the various revenue sources. We'll prioritize the, uh, the, the expenditures that give us the most uh, opportunity to improve public safety. And we'll make sure that 
We are efficient in how we manage the government such that we don't waste tax dollars, as have been done often in the past 15 years. Uh, as your next governor, that will be my priority. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Uh, governor Holcomb, you're next. You have one minute. Well, that's the beauty of our system. This is every year we come to the General Assembly and your uh, elected state representatives and your state senators and the governor have this discussion about where dollars will be allocated, usually during this upcoming session, the long session, the budget session in January. Our corporate income tax, by the way, is going down to 4.9%. Our individual income tax is 3.2%. The Tax Foundation has ranked Indiana in the top 10 in terms of our tax environment in the nation. So what we seek to do ultimately is make sure that Indiana remains a great state for businesses, for individuals to invest in, so we grow. That's where our pro-growth policies really pay off for Hoosiers, being a low cost of doing business and a low cost of living state, plus pro-growth policies on the business side equal getting ahead. Thank you, Governor. Last on this question, Mr. Rainwater, you have one minute. Thank you. So first of all, before we talk about taxes, what we need to do is talk about spending. And we need to realize that our state government wastes millions, if not billions of dollars a year on old processes, old systems, and just plain old fraud, waste, and abuse. And everybody knows it, they just don't want to talk about it. So first, what we have to do is we have to reduce the size and scope of our state government. We have to get government back within its means. We have to understand that then, once we have reduced cost of government, we can start doing things like eliminating the individual income tax here in the state of Indiana. Nine other states have done it. I believe that we need to do it. We can eliminate the personal property tax on your primary residence so the government can never take your home because you're on a fixed income and can't afford to pay property taxes. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Myers, you've requested a rebuttal. 30 seconds. I just wanted to point out that uh, the governor could have taken action this past summer to call a special session to keep the corporate tax in Indiana at 5.5 percent. Instead, it's going to go down, as he suggested, to 4.9 percent, while Hoosiers' incomes are suffering. Uh, that doesn't make any sense, especially during this time of a global pandemic when we have the, a recession underway and where we have Hoosiers that are hurting every single day. Thank you, Governor Holcomb. You've requested a rebuttal, 30 seconds. Yeah, I'd just like to put a shout out to the best cabinet in America. These folks are doing incredible work. They could all be doing other things in life, extremely talented with a lot of expertise. We have modernized so many systems in our state government over the years. Our Department of Revenue, our Department of Workforce Development, FSSA, things that are touching citizens every day to make sure that we're more efficient. We've been ranked the number one efficient state in America, by the way. Years ago, when my, one of my predecessors came into office, we were at 27,000 employees. We're there this year as well. We have cut to the bone. Thank Okay, we are going to move on to our fifth question now. We're going to stick with taxes, though. Although many seniors have paid their mortgages off, they are still paying property taxes. They may face, face tax liens and foreclosures because of rising prices and can't make paying property taxes on a fixed come possible uh, when they are making their other expenditures. A voter from Kokomo had this question. Will you consider eliminating yearly property taxes for seniors with combined incomes under $150,000? And we will be starting with Governor Holcomb on this one. You have one minute. Well, years ago under the Daniels administration, as I alluded to earlier, I mentioned we permanently in the Constitution capped property taxes for this very reason. We did one, two, three. For individuals, uh, we capped it at 1%. For farms, ag property, 2%. For businesses, 3%. For this very reason, and we just most recently for veterans, uh, made sure that we exempted their pensions from state income tax, again, for this very reason. Over the years, we've cut taxes 19 different times, property taxes, income taxes, corporate and individual. The question then remains, how do you replace the revenue if you eliminate some taxes? Are you going to eliminate your public safety? Are you going to eliminate school funding? Are you going to eliminate libraries and parks, Medicaid recipients, et cetera? So 
it's easy to talk about doing away with something, but you need to have a plan to replace it or citizens will suffer. Thank you, Governor. We move to Mr. Rainwater next. You have one minute. Well, perhaps uh, Governor Holcomb has forgotten that the 1% cap is on your assessed value and that they can come out and reassess your property every year, which means your taxes still go up and seniors are, are suffering because of that. Uh, I realize that one of the things that I have suggested as a possible alternative to personal property tax on your primary residence is converting that to a 7% sales tax due at the time of closing on your property. That would be a plan that would actually get people out of asset forfeiture and still provide some funding under property tax dollars uh, to the programs that need to be funded. Uh, moreover, I, I just think it's very important that we realize that, you know, Hoosiers need their money before the state needs it, and there's plenty of uh, things that can be cut as far as corporate welfare that have nothing to do with basic services. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rainwater. And last on this question, Dr. Myers. There are Hoosiers. We must make certain that we have minimal regulations that protect people's property rights from pollution, from uh, unnecessary use of eminent domain, and ensure that people understand that government will make sure operations. Thank you, Mr. Rainwater. Dr. Myers, you're next. You have one minute. The question was uh, with respect to the WSP plant. Uh, I've looked at the data that's available today with respect to that, and I've come out against it because there's just not enough safety information to give me the confidence that we need in order to, to create such a, a major uh, a, a factory that could put toxins in the atmosphere and that could hurt people. Uh, and there's been insufficient public input into the process thus far. So unless the information gets a lot better than I've seen so far, that's a plant that's going to be put on hold. Thank you, Dr. Myers. And uh, last on this question, Governor Holcomb. Yeah, we, we do this every day. The, actually, the governor of the state of Indiana chairs the Indiana Economic Development uh, uh, Corporation's board, 15-member board, designed to work with the private sector to encourage investment in the state of Indiana. We also work with our partners at the Indiana Department of Environmental Management to make sure that there is a permit process underway, to make sure there is public input uh, periods so that all viewpoints are considered and we make determinations based on fact. I will tell you this, it is working. Even during a global pandemic, the new jobs that have come in through the Indiana Economic Development Corporation are about 26,000. 16, we did just over 20,000, 20,320 to be exact. The trick is how do we skill up Hoosiers to fill those jobs and the other 109,000 that are unfilled right now? That's where our workforce development programs come in. Thank you, Governor Holcomb. Dr. Myers has requested a rebuttal. That's 30 seconds. You know, again, the question was about the WSP plant, uh, and uh, I have not heard uh, my opponents address that specific issue. With respect to IDEM, the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, their staffing levels have gone down. They haven't been adequately funded for a quite a long time, and in a Myers-Lawson administration, that's going to change. We're going to have the environmental team we need to make sure that our environment in Indiana is safe. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Mr. Rainwater, you've asked for a rebuttal. 30 seconds. Thank you. So the governor talks about uh, all these new jobs that they're going to bring in. And then he talks about the, uh, recently he said 118,000 high paying technical jobs that Hoosiers can't fill because they haven't been trained up for that. First of all, who's responsible for education in the state of Indiana? Secondly, uh, if these jobs are not fillable, by Hoosiers, what good does that do to the almost a million Hoosiers who've had to file for unemployment since March 1st due to these shutdowns? Thank you, Mr. Rainwater. And Governor Holcomb also requested a rebuttal. 30 seconds. So proud of the Hoosiers who have returned to the workforce, and we're going to stay at making sure everyone that's been displaced or has lost a job during this pandemic gets one as well. The good news is there's opportunity there. We had a 3.2% unemployment rate in February, January of this year. We rocketed up to 175 and we're down now to 6.2. We are a top five state for folks going back to work in the private sector, proving it can be done safely. 
quickly. Our environment is cleaner than it's ever been, air and water since the 1970s and the Clean Air and Water Acts. Thank you, Governor. We're gonna stick with the environment for the next question. The previous question focused on future development. Given the number of sites in the state that have drawn the attention of the EPA, what's your plan for cleanup of environmentally hazardous sites and how will you prioritize that activity? We're gonna start this question with Dr. Myers. You have one minute. Well, first of all, we're gonna staff up the Indiana Department of Environmental Management and the leader of that department is gonna work carefully and closely with the Department of Natural Resources and the new Indiana State Health Commissioner to make sure that we're prioritizing uh, the, the safety of Hoosiers around the state. Uh, our water and our air still have huge problems in, sa in the state of Indiana. Uh, we have overflow that's putting nitrates, uh, including E. coli bacteria into our water supply that's gone unabated. We have a tremendous difficulty with some parts of our state in terms of air pollution, primarily from plants uh, that, are remain, that remain uh, uh, in the coal burning mold. Uh, we know that uh, we can do a better job in the environment in Indiana. And in the Myers-Lawson administration, we're gonna prioritize renewable energy, clean energy, to make our state a lot safer than it is today. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Governor Holcomb, you're next, one minute. Yeah, again, just want to express how proud I am of the leadership and the, and the employees at the Indiana Department of Environmental Management. I, I, we don't judge our effectiveness in state government by the number of employees. We measure what we do. And the IDEM every day is working with local communities and businesses to make sure that they are uh, following the law that we continue to clean up our environment, whether it's a field or an abandoned property. This is, this is a huge asset for us and potential opportunity to redevelop. And we're doing this regionally every single day. I just, again, stress, air and water cleaner than it's ever been. 99% uh, in attainment for our air and our water, 97 plus percent. And our IFA, Indiana Finance Authority, has helped with uh, over a billion dollars, local communities continue to improve the cleanliness of their water systems. So we're hard at work at this every day. Thank you, Governor Holcomb and Mr. Rainwater. Your last, you have one minute. So first of all, we need to realize that the best way that we can clean up the aggression of polluters is to make them pay to clean it up, to hold them accountable, to hold them responsible and to make sure that the restitution that they pay is so large that they won't want to pollute. If we can do that, then we don't have to have the citizens of the state of Indiana paying to clean up somebody else's bad acts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rainwater. People from around the state brought up guns, including statistics about increases in gun violence, especially among young people and the rights of gun owners. A retired speech therapist wrote, the state of Indiana is suffering from an epidemic of gun violence. As governor, beyond enforcing the gun laws already on the books, what would you promote to decrease the incidence of injury and deaths by firearms? And we'll be hearing from Governor Holcomb first on this. You have one minute. Yeah, this is, uh of great concern to, I think, every Hoosier, not just gun violence, but violence in general. And uh, as we see it rise in, in certain areas, certainly as a state, uh, our Indiana State Police partner with local communities uh, and we'll continue to do that. We also wanna make sure that we protect our red flag law that makes sure that folks who are dangerous to themselves and to others are identified and those weapons are removed from with law enforcement and the court's involvement, of course, uh, those folks who are seeking to um, hurt others. And so we'll continue with our community policing efforts from a state perspective to work on the ground, on the street with our partners uh, in local communities all throughout the state of Indiana. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Rainwater, you are next. You have one minute. Thank you. First of all, I don't believe that uh, red flag laws uh, are appropriate because they violate the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. I also don't believe that the problem is guns. People are violent because there's evil in the world. You can't legislate that. What you can do is try to create an environment where people understand that if they do something 
as an act of aggression against someone else, they will pay a severe penalty for that aggression. We also need to understand that a lot of the violence we see, especially in our urban areas, is uh, the result of hopelessness and poverty, and we need to address that there and realize that we need to give people an opportunity to have economic opportunities instead of giving them uh, nothing but a lot of big government bureaucratic talk. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rainwater. Dr. Myers, you are last on this question. One minute, please. You know, I'm a physician. I've spent a great deal of time in the emergency room and in the ICUs taking care of victims of gunshot wounds, and I know how tragic they can be. I've seen what happens when a parent or someone leaves a gun around and a child picks it up and uses it on a fellow child or actually even on a parent. Uh, I know what the, it's like to tell a parent that one of their loved ones has committed suicide using a firearm. I know that we can do a much better job on gun safety in Indiana and nationwide, and I'll fight for that uh, as your governor. I'm the only candidate that's uh, been named a gun sense candidate uh, by Moms Demand Action, a, a group that's now nationwide that, that is fighting to make sure that we have better gun laws across our nation. Uh, I'll be in Washington, D.C. testifying to make sure that we get the federal changes that we need, as well as working here in Indiana to improve our gun laws to make, them, make our state a lot safer than it is today. Thank you, Dr. Myers. We're going to stick with guns. A number of voters asked if you support the right to care, for people to carry a firearm without a permit, or as some call it, constitutional carry. Whether you do or not, why do you think this has not been accomplished given that the Republicans control the General Assembly and the governor's office for the last several years? For this question, we'll be starting with Mr. Rainwater. You have one minute. First of all, I absolutely support constitutional carry in the state of Indiana, and I will work with the General Assembly to ensure that we get constitutional carry passed in 2021. Our Second Amendment rights are very, very crucial in ensuring that we as citizens can protect all of our other rights. Without that, we don't have a chance against big government or anybody else who wants to aggress against us. I believe that what we need to do is understand that some issues have been used to keep voters on the hook from election to election, and I believe constitutional carry is one of them. So we need to get that done and quit using it as a political ploy to win votes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rainwater. Next is Dr. Myers. You have one minute. No, I don't support moving forward with constitutional carry. You know, the Second Amendment uh, is going to survive just fine without more individuals carrying more weapons around, brandishing them, uh, and scaring many members of the public. I just don't support it. Uh, I do support increased background checks, electronic background checks, to make sure that everyone who is able to purchase a weapon does so uh, with a clean record. Uh, and I support us closing the loophole for gun shows uh, that allow private sales to occur without those background checks taking place. Uh, we've got to understand that guns kill people. Uh, in order for us to get our arms better, or much better around this problem, we've got to change what we're doing today. If we, keep doing, if we keep doing what we're doing now, we're going to keep the same results. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Uh, Governor Holcomb, you have the last answer on this question. One minute. You know, for years and years, the General Assembly, as long as I can remember going back, has cherished our Second Amendment and will continue to. Now, what we have to make sure of is that we don't hamstring our law enforcement officials when, they're, when they could prevent a tragic circumstances, and we know those occur. It's just reality. We have made it easy, in fact, free, to obtain a five-year uh, gun permit in the state of Indiana. So that's not a uh, cost consideration for those who want to own a gun for protection or for hunting, et cetera. So we'll continue to cherish the Second Amendment, and I don't want to do anything that would put law enforcement in a more dangerous situation. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Rainwater, you've requested a rebuttal. That's 30 seconds, please. Yes. First of all, uh, I've spoken to several law enforcement officers. My grandfather was one. My father was one when he was in his 20s. And they're all trained to expect that everyone, 
everyone that they encounter is carrying a firearm. And I just want to say that concealed carry or open carry, neither one is brandishing, and that brandishing is against the law, and we know this, and there is no reason to create fear for people where there is none. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rainwater. Governor Holcomb, you've requested a rebuttal. 30 seconds. Yeah, I agree that our law enforcement is trained when they do confront. I'm talking about before the fact, not after. Thank you. That was very brief. Uh, the next question is going to actually go to the issue of public health and more specifically about the governor's powers. There were several people who, when reflecting on the way the state handled the public health crisis, believed that the governor had sweeping powers and that Indiana's political system maybe was a bit out of balance. However, political scientists point out that Indiana's governor actually ranks as sort of a moderate position in terms of the amount of power when compared to all the other governors. We've received questions from Fortville to Fort Wayne asking about the powers of government. It has been seven months since a health emergency was declared. Under what circumstances should a special session of the General Assembly be called? Should one have been called by now? And we will be starting this question with Dr. Myers. You have one minute. Yes, we should have had a special session way back at the beginning of the pandemic, and I called for one uh, back when the pandemic uh, began. Uh, the, the governor has powers that he or she can use in order to protect the public in Indiana law today. Uh, and yes, you can challenge those powers in the court, but the first thing to do is to protect the public safety. I'd leave the, the court battles for later. Let's do what we can do right now to protect our citizens uh, from this virus until we have a safe and effective vaccine. And that's going to be a little bit longer. I'm going to wait until a Biden-Harris administration appoints a new director of the CDC and FDA, and that'll be very soon, in order to hear from them about the vaccines that are, are, are being uh, evaluated. And when they are approved, uh, I'm going to make sure that they're distributed effectively and safely throughout the state of Indiana. And then we can begin to consider relaxing some of the requirements that I will put in place immediately. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Governor Holcomb, you're next. You have one minute. Well, the constitutional question is not really a question at all. Uh, it has been floated and, and uh, threatened, et cetera, uh, but it passes constitutional muster. We, the governor does have the authority. Again, it was granted to the governor of the state of Indiana by the General Assembly, again, in their infinite wisdom. I look forward to sitting down with members of the General Assembly uh, come January if I return, and addressing any concerns that they may have. I was in constant communication despite uh, what's been alluded to with legislative leaders and members throughout the last eight months, as a matter of fact. And we soon will learn how they, in fact, will meet eight months into this uh, come January. And so I look forward to accommodating uh, uh, their wishes and, and entertaining their thoughts on how we can improve this. This is an extraordinary time, and we've had to take extraordinary measures, again, all constitutional. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Mr. Rainwater, you have the last answer on this question. You have one minute. Thank you. First of all, um, the members of the General Assembly are human beings. Uh, they don't have infinite wisdom. And in my opinion, the uh, extension of powers to the governor has been a mistake. And when I'm elected and inaugurated, the first thing I will do is go to the General Assembly and I will ask them to take away all of these extra powers that would allow a governor to spend seven or eight months without the special session of the General Assembly and just unilaterally legislating to the people of Indiana. And I would call on both of the other candidates to tell us right now, right here, whether or not they are willing to do the same thing. Because I don't believe the governor is a legislator. The governor is supposed to execute the laws that are passed by the General Assembly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rainwater. I'm going to take some liberty. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Myers. I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Myers. Yeah, I, I just wanted to suggest that the, the governor has the power today uh, to lead. The governor has the power today to say that we're going to have a mass mandate. There are going to be consequences and we're going to protect Hoosiers. Uh, and on the first day of the, of the General Assembly, I'm going to make that point very clear. 
probably to a General Assembly that is uh, tucked away in their offices or at home, hopefully, in order to protect, protect themselves uh, and to protect their staffs because in January, when the legislature comes into session, we're not gonna be out of the woods with respect to this pandemic. Thank you, Dr. Myers. One of the challenges of us being spread around the building is it's a little hard for me to know exactly who's requested rebuttals, and I apologize to Dr. Myers for that. Dr. Holcomb, are you, or excuse me, Governor Holcomb, are you asking for a rebuttal as well? Please. Please take one, 30 seconds. Yeah, Thank you. Uh, I'm surrounded by doctors all day long. I even call myself a doctor every once in a while. Uh, Look, I'll sit down with the members of the General Assembly should I return in January, and we'll address this. And there are uh, 150 legislators in the building, and every single one of them's uh, opinion and approach matters. And so we'll address this and a whole lot of other issues, uh, not hypotheticals, uh, but as they come, come January. Thank you. We are going to move, I believe, it's to our next to last question, probably, given how long the answers have been running. This one, I'm going to take some liberties and actually mash together a couple of questions, one from an iron worker and one from a data, data analyst. Some businesses throughout the state are struggling. How will you help them reopen and how will you help small businesses in general grow? We're going to start this answer with Governor Holcomb. You have one minute. Yeah, this is a strength for the state of Indiana, and I don't want to sugarcoat it or overlook the struggling businesses that are out there due to COVID-19. We did take $30 million of the CARES um, Act dollars uh, and devote it to small businesses all over the state of Indiana. We did take $200 million and make sure that we created a PPE marketplace so businesses could uh, reopen safely. There was $9 billion that came from our federal partners, the federal government, in the PPP program, over 83,000 forgivable loans that small businesses, uh, many of which obviously took part of. Again, what we don't wanna do is give up our high ground. We've been ranked number one in terms of small business friendly, uh, friendliness and for entrepreneurship in the Midwest and a top ranked state in the country. So we have the environment and the ecosystem to grow. What we have to do is make sure that we're continuing to help build a bridge to the other side of COVID-19. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Rainwater, you're next, you have one minute. Thank you. First of all, COVID-19 didn't close any small businesses. Uh, executive orders did. And unfortunately, executive orders did that said that some small businesses were essential and some were not. That some businesses provide the necessities of life and some don't. Unfortunately, every Hoosier is essential and every small business Every business of every size provides the necessities of life to the people who depend on it for their living so that they can pay their bills and feed their kids and make sure that they pay their mortgage. Unfortunately, that didn't matter for the last 10 months. But what we have to do is we have to reinvigorate small business by giving them their money back and letting them invest their money instead of expecting government to uh, take money and then do what they want to with it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rainwater. And Dr. Myers, you have the last answer on this question. One minute, please. You know, the COVID-19 has truly devastated a number of small businesses. There is no doubt about that whatsoever. And as governor, I will do absolutely everything to re-energize small business leadership in the Indiana, in the state of Indiana, by helping those with the entrepreneurial spirit uh, cut through uh, government red tape and get their businesses started. Uh, with the help perhaps of small business navigators, especially for the veteran-owned businesses and the women minority-owned businesses that have had such a hard time uh, moving forward here in our state. I'm gonna change that uh, in my administration with uh, Lieutenant Governor Lawson. Uh, and yes, uh, we're gonna get PPE, we're gonna get it at a good price, we're gonna make it available to everyone uh, in the state. Uh, unlike uh, the response that we had early on, we could have gotten PPE at a lot cheaper, but we didn't. Uh, and so that's going to change as well. We're going to do the things that are going to help our state to be efficient uh, and effective uh, in its leadership role with respect to all businesses, but especially the small businesses, which are the engine of growth for any state, including Indiana. Thank you, Dr. Myers. There was somebody who asked for a rebuttal. I'm sorry, I wasn't sure who it was. Governor, if you would, please, 30 seconds. Yes, uh, I'll be brief. Uh, if you rewind the tape and go back to um, late March, 
we basically did have to shut, hunker down, shut down some of Indiana so we didn't overwhelm our healthcare system because of the very fact that every Hoosier is essential. We did that and we were very methodical about it and that was basically the month of April. We never shut down the state of Indiana. Now some businesses uh, have suffered because of COVID-19 to this day. Thank you very much. We are going to move to our final question and everybody will have about 30, maybe 35 seconds to answer this question. This question comes from a libertarian in Brownsburg. What do you believe is the fundamental role of government and if elected, how do you plan to fulfill that role? First, we'll be hearing from Governor Holcomb. Yeah, we are, uh, as governor, um, charged with overseeing all the very agencies that interact with citizens on a hourly, minute-by-minute -minute basis. And fortunately, the state of Indiana over the last 16 years has enjoyed a lot of certainty and predictability and continuity in terms of our not just hope for the future, but our growth. We see that when it comes to our economy, we see that when it comes to our families, and we see that when it comes to our communities. We'll continue to focus on just that. Thank you, Governor. Mr. Rainwater, you have 30 seconds. So, in the Declaration of Independence, Thomas Jefferson said, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. He didn't say to do economic development or to protect you from yourself or to protect you from a virus. He said to secure these rights. And I believe that it is government's responsibility to secure your individual rights and not infringe on them and use a crisis as an excuse. So that is, to me, the function of government. Thank you very much, Mr. Rainwater and Dr. Myers. You have 30 seconds. You know, the Declaration of Independence also said that we should be able to pursue life, liberty, and happiness, and not every Hoosier is able to do that. You know, the question was, what should government, what should the, the, the governor do? How should we lead? How should government move forward? I'm gonna appoint terrific leaders to our state agencies to get the job done. And if I wasn't clear at the beginning, uh, I plan to reappoint Secretary uh, Jennifer McCormick. Dr. McCormick has done a terrific job. She knows that we can do better in education in Indiana, and she'll be one of the first people that I'll sit down with to make this state better. Thank you, Dr. Myers. Gentlemen, thank you for being here to share your views on these important issues, and thank you to everyone who's watching or listening to this debate conducted by the Indiana Debate Commission. You can hear more from these candidates on Tuesday, October 27th, when they debate here again at WFYI. We want to thank WFYI for producing and hosting this debate, as well as our numerous affiliates and supporters, but especially our major sponsors this year, AARP Indiana and the Indiana Brad Broadcasters Association. Early voting is underway and election day is Tuesday, November 3rd. Please be sure to vote and let your voice be heard. I'm Andrew Downs and on behalf of the Indiana Debate Commission, good night. <laughs>